Good evening, everyone, and welcome. My name is Josh Owen. I'm the Vignelli Distinguished Professor of Design and the Director of the Vignelli Center for Design Studies. I'm delighted to welcome you to this second lecture of this academic year's Vignelli Design Conversations series presented by Design Milk and RIT's Magic Center and made possible in part by the generosity of RIT alumnus Chris Bailey and Bailey Brand Consulting. Continuing the thread of connections to the Vignelli legacy begun with our first talk of this academic year, tonight's lecture further acknowledges and extends the influence of the Vignelli's work. Looking ahead, I invite you all to join our mailing list on the center's website and stay tuned for our social channels uh, for news about the upcoming speakers in this year's exciting continued series. Rochester Institute of Technology's Vignelli Center for Design Studies is an international hub for education, research, collaboration, and advocacy, which expands the scope of programs in the College of Art and Design School of Design. The facility houses the archive of renowned designers Lella and Massimo Vignelli, whose works are icons of international design. The center and archives sit within RIT's College of Art and Design, which was built on the traditional territory of the Onondaga, or people of the Great Hill. In English, they're known as Seneca people, keepers of the Western door. They're one of the six sovereign nations that make up the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. We honor the land on which RIT was built and recognize the unique relationship that the indigenous stewards have with this land. That relationship is the core of their traditions, cultures, and histories. We recognize the history of genocide, colonization, and assimilation of indigenous people that took place on this land. Mindful of these histories, we work towards understanding, acknowledging, and reconciling. As stewards of history and content, we must acknowledge and seek to learn from our context, bad and good, ugly and beautiful. This applies to the Vignelli Center as with any archive. The Vignellis taught us that design is a systematic framework for solving the world's most intractable problems. If recent times have taught us anything, it's that while we as humans are adaptable, our societies and systems have major flaws. We're at a point when we need to have difficult discussions and work to create a new balance in the world. In this, design must play a critical role. As the director, I aim to make the Vignelli Center even more accessible and applicable by bringing in stimulating guest contributors from diverse and underrepresented backgrounds who help us to consider design in innovative ways. The Vignelli's design is one philosophy leaves us with a universal message that design is a lens through which we can envision a more inclusive tomorrow. Before introducing tonight's guest, I'd like to take a few moments to set the stage. Out of respect for our presenter, participants will be muted for the duration of the event, but we do encourage you to enter questions you have for our presenters using the Q&A feature both during and after the talk, and we'll try to get to as many of the questions as possible during our closing Q&A segment. I'd like to thank our captioner, Angela Maddox, and our interpreters, May Reed Rowan and Darla Gujardo, for their work this evening. For tonight's lecture, we welcome Reza Aliabadi. Aliabadi is a Canadian artist and architect of Persian origin. He is the founder of Atelier RZLBD, an art and architecture practice based in Toronto, whose work extends to making arts, crafting objects, designing buildings, curating installations, and publishing a zine uh, called RZLBD Post. His work has been distinguished with numerous accolades, including the International Architecture Master Prize, American Architecture Prize, and our Ontario Association of Architects Awards, exhibited in many venues, including the Sir John, Soens Museum in London, the World Architecture Festival in Berlin and Amsterdam, the School of Architecture at McGill University in Montreal, and Toronto Harbourfront Centre, and celebrated more than 100 print publications. In 2017, RZLBD was selected among the top emerging design talents in Canada. The same year, UK publisher Artifice released a monograph RZLBD Hopscotch, which was which recognized his selected built projects by collecting essays from project profiles, 
and annotated drawings. RZ LBD's new book, The Empty Room, was released by Akhtar Publishers in 2020. I am particularly drawn to a quote from Reza's website, which says of his practice, quote, it is not just an ordinary operation, rather like a positive virus, it contributes, communicates, challenges, and adapts itself to the needs of each project and its context. From a 17 millimeter wedding ring to a 56 kilometer long housing proposal, end quote. The latter part of that quote reminds me of an Italian architect Ernesto Rogers, whose famous declaration that he wanted design, he wanted to design everything from a spoon to city uh, is a quote also beloved by the Vignellis. With this wide perspective of design in mind, please join me in a big virtual Vignelli Center. Welcome for Reza Ali Abadi. Thank you, Josh, for the very kind introduction. It's such a pleasure to be with you tonight. Also such a great honor to do this in relation to Vanielli's archive, their legacy and their influence on, I, I, I wouldn't like to say many of us, I would like to say all of us. I guess with that, I better pay the homage to the Vanielli's and uh, the poster itself is a great indication to that. Um, I just copied him freely and voluntarily with no shame using the Swiss style Helvetica typeface, the black and white color, the clarity, the simplicity that was so cherished by their practice. As for the title for tonight's talk, you had given me a carte blanche and uh, you just mentioned that um, phrase by Ernesto Rogers and Massimo almost in all his interviews and his speech, he referred to that Ernesto's phrase. And together with Leila, they accomplished that during their practice, um, designing everything. So I thought, why not? This could be a great um, occasion. And I could share with you from the smallest thing I have designed so far to the largest proposal we have designed in the studio. Um, there is also a regret. This was supposed to be in person in 2020, in the occasion of the 10th anniversary of the Vignelli Center, which accidentally coincided with the 10th anniversary of RZLBD in Toronto. And for that, we had launched a whole series of projects and ephemerals and videos called Project X. And I had taken that as a good sign, I still do, but still, it's a pleasure to do this virtually. There is another love affair that I have to mention, and that is with another great uh, persona, Louis Kahn. He has this great building in Rochester, the First Unitarian Church. And this brick is an actual brick from that building. I didn't, uh, I didn't steal it. There was a Saturday market next to the, to the building. And apparently there are still some leftover bricks. And one of my assistants was so kind to bring it as a souvenir for me. Also, brick is important because to me it stands, it carries the hope, the optimism to achieve something large with a very small module that you can hold in your hand. So I guess any practice, any any body of work as an edifice consists of many small bricks that you gradually put together, like an image pixel by pixel, a building brick by brick. Last but not least, there is this beautiful lady from Rochester. She lives at the window seal of the atelier in Toronto. It's a peregrine falcon. I called her Khatun, but she is also known as Quest. And as you know, in the beginning of their lifespan, for three years, they wander around the whole Americas, perfectly capture a visual um, map from the whole continent until they settle for a territory. And I, and I guess we are privileged in the studio that this beautiful lady from your city has decided to make a nest next to our studio. 
Um, we opened an Instagram page for her, so you can follow all the drama and accidents and excitement of uh, her life and the family through this page. I think with Massimo, Khan, and a Peregrine Falcon, I, I have the hat trick, so I guess uh, I got it right to start the presentation. There is also a disclaimer. Usually when there is a longer duration for a talk, I try to cover some autobiographical themes, some formative foundations, but tonight will be a short talk and I will just share with you some art design and architecture project. To warm up, I start with the extremes, the smallest and the largest. Um, the wedding ring, they happened in 2005 and I had envisioned the whole thing as a two page book. The black represents the binding. You have a blank page before the marriage and the one spoiled with the rings represents the rest of the life. Um, the ring were hand polished silver. They were encased in a half inch thick walnut wood, closed to present it to the groom and bride. And the longest one, we called it Young City because we designed it for Youngest Street in Toronto, which is the longest street in the world. The proposal tried to tackle three ideas. One was to tilt a tower. Towers by nature, they offer hierarchy. They are discriminatory structures. So we thought, what if we just rotate it 90 degree and that action on its own will make the construction super affordable. It releases you from the challenges of electrical, mechanical, plumbing issues. You won't be dealing with a congested traffic, so everything will be dispersed. And density will be stretched versus being extruded. The second idea was often big cities are very detached. So the opportunities, including entertainment, infrastructure, finance, they are dispersed in different locations of a city. And we call it downtown, midtown, uptown. So what if that tilted tower becomes a continuous structure? So instead of a detached town, we will have a long town. And the third idea was where would be the site for a project such as this one? Often all these uh, residential development in big cities are drive with market speculation. So how could we release the site from that disease? And then we thought of a streets. As Khan mentioned, a street is a room of agreement. And it was a, the obvious choice if we are proposing this for Toronto, we take Youngest Street as the site. So you can imagine a tower that could be 56 kilometer long, but it's leaning on its side on the Youngest Street from Lake Ontario all the way to the north to Lake Huron. Another advantage of a horizontal continuous structure is you can do it in stages and phases. You don't have to do it in one take, which is the case for high rise or skyscrapers. Why did we do this for Toronto? You might be surprised to know that in Toronto, which is at the moment one of the 10 most expensive city in the world to live in, one out of every seven residents is struggling for a habitat. And this is why the number of condominium under construction in Toronto occupies the spot number one in the whole world. But I guess all those productions are addressed for a specific bubble of buyers. They won't address the housing issue in the city. So for that purpose, we put together this proposal. The phase one, which will be 2.7 kilometers, will start from address one at Youngest Street all the way 
um, to the Blue Ridge Street, which is the core of downtown Toronto. We put together the whole proposal as a love letter for the city we live in. So all the renderings are prepared as a postcard with the stamp of Canada Post on one corner. This long leaning tower is shaped by 2.5 by 2.5 space frame, continuous hoovering around above the youngest street and you can insert shipping container as habitats. And then you have a second street which is all pedestrian above the youngest street which could be an homage to the High Line in New York. And these are some vistas from above the pedestrian path, some of the balconies of residential towers along the youngest street, the path itself. And this gives you an idea that how you can insert these prefabricated modules within this space frame. And these are 10 imaginary sections and plans which could represent the neighborhoods along this super long path. And we did 100 variations that you can achieve by the two typical available container dimensions. Initially, I didn't want to share these two I thought it's fun that we define the extremes for the projects, but I thought it's not fair. So I included them, but here is where the real presentation starts. As designers, artists, and architects, we often deal with this uh, challenge of creating something new, something fresh all the time. Yet novelty for the sake of novelty, it's not a virtue to many artists and designers, including the Vanielli's. It was until I read this quote by one of my beloved writer, Borges, that somehow it liberated me from that, that pressure that we don't have to come up with something new all the time. We are already influenced and inspired by, by many things, places we visited, books that we read, people we met. So maybe life is or can be an iteration on what is already there. And I guess this by definition divides artists, designers and architects into two groups. So on one side, you can put people like Vanielli's, Dieter Rams, Jasper Morrison, Fukusawa, his beautiful CD player is behind Josh on the shelf. And on the other hand, you can put people like Philip Stark or Ani Rashid, um, it's either or, and I guess for us, it's a choice to pick the direction. Definitely, I would like to submit to the former versus the latter. With that, I'll share with you one of the ongoing series that I'm working on for the last uh, 10 years or so. Um, and it started by paying an homage to people whom I believe they inspired me and influenced me. So at the same time, this could be a confession unfolding the list of those beloved people. It all started with this beautiful vintage Olivetti machine designed by Ettore Sozzas, another reference to Milanese school, Ernesto Rogers, and the whole gang of those um, golden days. So I got this. And then I thought, what if leather and a manual typewriter are being pushed beyond their utilitarian purpose? So with that and a dose of madness, I started putting together these letters for people I admire. This one is for Carl Andre. This one is for Joseph Albers. Of course, these are the canon of modernist, abstract, minimalist artist, and I had to pick works that are presentable with black and white by a Cartesian grid dictated by the mechanical limitation of a manual typewriter. And bear in mind, 
you can you don't have the luxury of a control z so every time you make a mistake you have to throw the paper away and start the thing from scratch this is for piet mondrian this is for the great malevich um, he has a special place because the whole movement of avant-garde and modernism started with him and the Russian constructivist. He also covered a range of discipline from sculpture, art, painting, architecture, design, so on and so forth. This is for Ellsworth Kelly. This is for Colum Innes. This is for the great Barnett Newman. This is for Donald Judd. This is for Frank Asilla, his early black series. This is for Agnes Martin, the Canadian one among the gang. This is for Ad Reinhardt. This one is for Tony Smith. So I started with paying homage to artists, but slowly, slowly the project evolved into two, into two series. One being homage to all artists, but the second one became autonomous projects. This one are series of letters to time. So I had this sand glass in front of me, looking at it and keep typing the T. These are a series of letters for a gambler. I rolled dice randomly, six set of six. And when you are lucky and you got a pair, it's red. Funny enough, it shows if you keep trying, you will be lucky enough. This is a letter for Big Ur Pi. So far, I tried 1,000 digit. It's still ongoing. Speaking of serial work, this is another thing that I cherish in my practice which is the notion of self-imposed rules, denying the notion of having total freedom as an artist or designer or an architect. So in 2012, I started doing a new series by then called 100 series, defining a set of rules, a modus operandi, and within that self imposed restriction and rules, trying to come up with variations and iterations. The first series, I called it Restless Cube. I started with the cube. I gave myself 15 to 10 minutes. I did one cube every night and I was allowed to do iteration via subtraction. So often we would like to do things by adding what if you are limited to create variety only by purging, by sifting, by subtracting things from an entity? So every night I started from the same queue, but arrived at a new variation. To give you a sense of the scale, each one of these queue is done on a paper 10 centimeters by 10 centimeters. So here you see the process, but this is the whole family, the taxonomy of all the cubes. But I guess the point is looking at them as a family, not as an individual cube. Doing things as series, I think individuality goes away and the message that comes with the whole set becomes more important. You can compare it with the language and the whole syntax and grammar behind it versus the vocabulary and the definition of words by word. After that, I was interested to try that addressing identity, visual identity. We often think identity is something constant and concrete. And for many of us, our logotype represents that visual identity or that brand. So this is how the logo for RZLDD shape based on a modular four by five grids. And then I thought, is this the only representation of the practice and the whole diverse body of work that comes out of it? The answer was definitely not. So with that, I started to do variations on that logo type. Here I put six for you. Along the way, it, it became long, 
like a game. So here you see from the top left, a giraffe, a camel, a kangaroo, top right, and the bottom row, you see the horse, the elephant, and the lion. And this is the whole family. And this is the key for the puzzle. And then I extended the same challenge into three-dimensional logo type. So we carved it out of wood, and then we tried to do it as a volume. And here is the whole set. With that, I started to tackle other topics and other issues. Sometimes they were commentary on other projects. Sometimes they were autonomous on their own. This one is inspired by the Labra tar pits in LA and the Lachman Museum by Peter Zumthor. So the rule was you can do one continuous stroke with a brush on a handmade Japanese paper. So each time you do a closed polyline and then you paint it black. And this is the result of it. it, it this could be a new signage system or a new alphabet on its own. I walk a lot and I usually do it with my heads down, mapping the ground, whether it's a ravine or the street or something. While on, on many of my walks on the street of Toronto, these cracks that are filled with tar on the streets, they reminded me of Franz Klein abstract expressionist painting in, in the 50s. So I mapped them all and on an overcast day, I photographed them. But taking each one of them, I had him in mind, trying to, to imitate the same composition he achieved with brush on the canvas. This is another attempt. This time the topic was door. And I think door on their own are very interesting because they represent a threshold between two conditions, two entities. Um, they could be like verbs, decisions that we make, actions that we take, and things on the either side are quite different. Yet, sometimes the decisions are straightforward and simple. Sometimes they are more complex, so there are consequences. You take a decision, but there, there, are, there is already another decision embedded in that decision. So these are again 10 centimeters by 10 centimeters, pencil and acrylic on cardboard. This is the whole set. You might be curious of the color coding. I thought on one side we have the blue on the other side, we have the orange. So all doors that are open outward take you to the blue world. All doors that are opening inward take you to the orange world. So in fact, blue and orange, they are just color coding the two different conditions on either side of the door. Light is another interesting theme in my practice. Here, I was trying to see if you can draw with light and for that, we started building very thin models by taping white paper on white paper and then casting the light on each word. And the theme was exploring the geometry within a square. So they are all symmetrical and they are all key and lock of each other. So in fact, if you take, flip and put it back, you have a clear, volume. If this was trying to draw with line, the next series was trying to sift the light. Interestingly, light in many culture stands as the epitome of purifying, the, the ultimate purifier. Here I tried to put handmade washi paper, so I had seven of them, shuffle them, take a picture. So there were 5,000 plus variety. I only tried 100 of them. Continuing with light, the next exercise was how you can trap the light, draw with light, sift the light, trap the light. So this was like an apparatus built as a cartridge with 10 sheets of cardboard that you could shuffle because the number was 10, the variations for were way beyond 5,000. 
but again we tried 100 of them this could be also compared to a love making machine where the light and the machine make love and the offsprings are the shadows another series is object towers here i played with lego i i mentioned that often towers address authority power hierarchy and discrimination so what if the team change into play the joy of building them and tearing them down and building them again this is a two by two gray lego brick and as usual again i pushed it into 100 rules where you can only do 25 floors it has to be symmetrical in plan and in elevation next one with two by four yellow lego bricks again same same rules 25 stories symmetry in plan and elevation and pushing it all the way to 100 iteration another ongoing series is spatial cocktails and the reason I started them was often architecture is very much uh, limited to many external forces such as zoning, regulation, bylaws, building code, consultants, other engineers. So you can never exercise a space as an autonomous entity. So this set of drawings and paintings are dedicated to space. And I used ink wash technique. And in all of them, the intention is to create a spatial condition free of any program, any materiality, often things that limit architecture as a discipline. And same as the cocktail, they are done with liquors, wine, all sorts of uh, alcoholic uh, drinks. And speaking of inspiration and influence, here I can mention Stanley Kubrick, his obsession with one point perspective. This is one of the work that is in the Sir John Song Museums in London. Next project I would like to share with you is trans image um, before starting my practice back in 2010 i developed this habit of quitting my job once a year and each time i just pushed myself as far as i could once i went to north pole once i backpacked around the world in 49 days and once i did a trans canada trip from east coast to west coast it took me five days and I drove about 1000 kilometer a day. One thing I did was every 100 kilometer, I took a picture and the shoulder line of the road was the datum. So I took all these pictures and then I sorted them into three categories, which represents the geographical zone of Canada, the shield, the prairies and the Rockies. And then I superimposed them on top of each other. So the first trans image represents the shield, the second one, the prairies, and the last one, the Rockies. So the intention was, how can you generate more possibility to read from an image by superimposition, also to dissolve the boundary between painting and photograph as two medium. So you can see the quality of the sky, the greenness of the, the foliage and the field, the blue, it varies from zone to zone. Speaking of photography, I always use it as, uh, as a way to, to record things, try to see things, try to keep myself agile, and borrow inspiration from all the mundane things that are around us on a daily basis. And with that, I have abstraction as rule number one in my mind. So within the chaos and clutter of the life around us, I try to capture the minimum, the simple, the clear. Some of them are 
from famous landmark, amazing buildings or artworks. Some of them are from a very simple, typical objects and sceneries that are around all of us. This one is by the great Isamu Naguchi in Kimball Art Museum. Here, the Y is the Tadao Ando Fort Worth Museum. I guess this one is very obvious, the Rome Sham by the great Corbusier. This is just asphalt, the street, a light picture on an IKEA big box store. So instead of doing it as a passive visual diary, to me is like a conscious exercise. This is interesting. One is a close up from an iceberg from my North Pole trip. This is from Manhattan. This is a courtyard of a mosque in Cairo, Egypt. And these are the stairs of the Grand Arc in Paris, France. It's quite a wide range. I also brought with me some objects and installations. So I guess slowly I'm departing from art into design. The first one called Big Enough is an installation we did for Harvard Front Center back in 2012. The theme for the exhibition was big enough, how much space do we need to live in? And this is what I came up with as I thought the whole notion of space is something very relative, whether the way we register it with our body or the way we conceive it with our mind. So the whole installation is like a passage, which is very, very tiny and narrow in the center. And I borrowed that measurement from the Neufert standard for architecture, which is very, very close to a coffin. So from both ends you get in and depending to your specific conception of the space, you may find the zone that is big enough for you, which varies from individual to individual. There was, this is the view from the outside and these are the view from the inside. There was a window in the museum and then I thought maybe we can benefit from that natural light because light quite opposite of the darkness affects our conception and perception of the space. So the narrowest and tiniest portion of the passage is the brightest one. Josh kindly mentioned the positive virus. It all started with another installation which we did for the Earth Day. And the whole intention was to raise the awareness. How can you recycle, repurpose, reuse something very mundane and make it a design feature? So we use pylons. And not all the virus are bad like COVID. This is a positive virus and design has to be a positive virus. And I think this is another relation to Massimo and the legacy of Vignelli's practice. This one we did for the recent election in Canada. And we thought of flag as something that represents a nation. With all the used Nespresso pods in the office, we decided to do the Maple Leaf of Canada. So what is this? This is my flag, your flag, our flag. With all these ongoing tension and discussions around diversity, the whole notion of inclusivity, and everything, we thought this would be a new representation of a nation, a collective image shaped by all taste, textures, aromas, very similar to diversity that exists in coffee. Open Cube is sculpture versus installation, which is a result of a collaboration between a painter and a sculptor and myself. And for the first time, 
I just designed something and I didn't did the craft part of it. So as we move on from art projects to installation, when the project changes its character, you become more like a designer and less of an artist. So you direct, you manage, you shape, but because of the scale and all the external diversity is applicable to the formation or fabrication of a building or of a sculpture, you, you, you rely on trades, soft trades, contractors, consultants. The next installation is a series of faces that I did with IKEA and Richelio doorknobs and hardwares and door handles. Here is a blow up of one of them. And here you see the whole family. And I guess with that, I moved to design and architecture projects. And of course, I would like to start that with a quote from Massimo. And I truly um, believe this as in continuation of my reference to novelty versus not novelty, this could be another nice reference that it's not about inventing something out of imagination, but it's always coming from a logic trying to answer a problem. So design is a solution, an appropriate one. I start with a couple of logo types. The first one is for an art gallery called Arshiv. This is a familiar one. You already saw that. This is for the mobile application for the pro professional um, engineering exam in Ontario. This is for a clinic called AK. This is a chair we designed for a boutique restaurant back in 2013. They wanted a designer chair, yet as always with a limited budget. And the challenge was without mass production, how can you do something and keep the cost low? So we went after a system which gave us the possibility to achieve that. It's hand polished stainless steel with painted MDF for the seat and the resilient back, you might not believe it, but is the insulation material for plumbing and piping with adjustable leg underneath. So we did it in two different heights for dining and bar. And this is the design evolution, starting with a line, folding it and a technical drawing. We had designed a whole place for a client. They had a nice uh, art collection at the place and they were looking for a seating solution to complement the feature wall that collects all the artworks and sculptures that they had. They couldn't find anything convincing and affordable at the marketplace. So they asked us to design it for themselves. We borrowed the module from the opening of the wall that we had designed ourselves and we came up with this modular system. The collection was very rich and sophisticated. So with the modular bench, while the whole formal representation of it is modern, with fabrication, we decided to build that with layered plywood sheet. So looking from each volume from the side, you will register that sophisticated texture of laminated plywood. So it is something new and contemporary looking, but at the same time, the craft side of it represents a degree of sophistication and of, I would say elegance. The logo type that I showed you for AK Clinic, we also did the clinic for the client. The whole story behind it was he wanted to do a prototype 
so that they can expand it into a franchise of clinics that they are going to do in Ontario. The limitation of the association is six feet by 10 feet for a medical exam room, which doesn't make sense at all. But of course, they go with that so they are able to divide a clinic space into more exam rooms. So how can you do all those things in a, in a room that is small? We thought it's better to collect everything in the back wall and leave the whole room free for the doctor and the patient. So this is the exploded perspective of the whole room. And this is the view when you enter it from the front. It's like two protecting hands from below and from above, protecting the body, which is the, the most important thing in a doctor's office. So for the below, we have the porcelain. For the top, we have cedar wood. And we decided to leave it unfinished. So the aroma of wood is in the space. So it's quite a haptic experience when you are there. And in order to help to make the space less um, claustrophobic, we use a ribbon of window all around the perimeter of the room. And all the millworks are parked in the back. And you see in the mirror image that on the bottom portion, the middle part is empty. And this is where the doctor will park the stool and the cart for the equipment. This is the opposite view. Such a small project. The speak speaking of uh, small projects, I share with you the smallest house we have done so far. The property is only 20 feet wide. And because of the zoning regulation, the house could be only 16 feet wide. So what would you do in a 16 feet wide space? By default, as designers and architects, we raise walls to define a space. But if the space is so small, by raising a wall, almost every part of that space will become almost useless. So looking at the project in plan and section, I thought, what if we put two shafts inside this rectangle, which comes from the zoning regulation? One could be a void, like a real shaft of light, and the other one could house all the wet zones of the house, such as bathrooms, kitchens, etc. And then in section, we shifted half a story. So Basically, you have six rooms without raising any walls, and each room received its character by the height difference between other rooms and by its location on one side of the shaft. This is the exploded axo of the floor planes, the shaft, and the two wet zones, which are displaced above the ground and underground. The shaft also brings the light all the way in, also creates chimney effect and natural ventilation in the summertime. So the house is quite energy efficient as well. That shift in the section gave us a carport looking towards the street, also a rooftop looking toward the backyard and the south. The study model for the house, we used all recycled materials. So these Corten steels are all recycled. And the house is looking at a busy street. So for a couple of reasons, number one, noise, two, privacy, and three, thermal exchange to the north. Looking towards the street, the house is very closed. Yet on the south, it's very open. But there are a couple of more windows behind the wood skirt. So in the night shot, you see those extra windows. So you maintain the privacy, but you have better view from the street. This is the view from the shaft, looking from the bedroom at the third floor all the way down to the kitchen on the main floor. So there is this visual continuity in the whole project. This is the view at the living room and kitchen on the main floor. 
and you see the half flight of a staircase on both sides of the shaft. This is the loft or the mezzanine between the living room and kitchen and the bedrooms on the upper floor. Very limited color palette, simple materials. And this is the view looking upward from the kitchen all the way to the skylights on top of the shaft and the floating light fixtures in between. And this is the view in the context. This is very typical of Toronto. I'm still surprised that how come the most multicultural city in the world or one of the most multicultural city in the world has a very homogeneous architecture when it comes to residential neighborhoods. If Shaft House is the smallest project we did in the city, Opposite House is the longest house we have done so far. It sits in a dramatic landscape looking at Lake Ontario and the house itself is 146 feet long. It's equal to an Airbus A321. It took me almost half an hour to walk around the site to register the scale of the property before starting the design. This is the view of the study model we made for the project. You see the ravine and you see the height difference between the house and the Lake Ontario, which is about 60 meters. This shows the profile of the site and this is the site plan. The location for the house was dictated by all the regulation, zoning and bylaws, also with the minimal damage to existing trees at the properties. If the shaft house was built around a vertical access the Mondi to configure the whole program, here I adapted an institutional typology for a residential project. So owning a beautiful site like that, one of the major requests from the client was they wanted the view of the lake from every single space of the house. So we decided to put a hallway in the center and then put all the servant program, such as the garage, the mudroom, the bathroom on the north side, and all the serve program on the south side, opposite each other, like a double loaded corridor in any institutional typology. And this is how the name for the project came, the opposite house. Of course, this is an homage to Louis Kahn again, because this whole notion of served and servant spaces coined by him. So we have all the bedrooms, kitchen, living room, family room on the south side and other spaces on the north. I am more interested in diagrams that unfold the idea or a concept behind the project versus the typical floor layout. So I'm sharing with you the spatial organization, which we do for every project done at the office. Also the invisible geometries. So with that, the, the floor plan will make sense because you will see that how every single space is relied on a perfectly developed grid system. Here, this could be an homage to Vanielli's and their beloved grid system. But of course, as Massimo always said, you should govern the grid. Don't let the grid to govern you. So use it as a disciplinary method to handle the project, but don't let it to hijack the project from you. These are the floor plan. In the main floor, you see the long spine in the center, two bedrooms bookend all the public spaces, kitchen, dining room, and living room. There are two floating millworks, one between the kitchen and the dining room, which is an espresso bar, and another one between the dining room and the living room, which is a double-sided fireplace. And on the north, you see the en-suites, the walk-in closets, home office, shared bathroom, mudroom, and the garage. The study model for the project, and this is the view. There are 19 identical plane of glass representing the south elevation. 
And that was another challenge to keep it consistent and equal. So every space behind those curtain wall has to be a correct measure of the glazing system. So the master bedroom four, kitchen three, dining room three, living room four, the agora or amphitheater two, and the guest bedroom three. This on its own represented quite and a structural engineering challenge because we had this 146 feet long span and we had to avoid the deflection. So we had a quite elegant structural engineering um, solution developed for the project, which is a very delicate metal structure offset from the glazing system inside the house, concealed behind the window mullion to make it almost uh, invisible. If the south is transparent, open, a smooth white stucco, on the north it's closed, it's textured, it's handmade black brick imported from Denmark. So even the exteriority of the project represents that opposition between the two sides of it. Here on the view from the northwest corner, you see the, the two volumes, the black one and the white one. This is the interior view from the very long spine, separating the south and north. And you see how beautifully light penetrates in from the white volumes looking toward the south. At the entrance, there is this intersection between Northwest and Southeast access. And there we changed the staircase of the house into an amphitheater and we called it Agora. So it's the place of gathering. You can celebrate the view, look at the Lake Ontario, or you can roll down the screen and enjoy a movie or a hockey game. And instead of a continuous staircase, we have this platform with intervals, hot rolled metal steels, shaping the steps in between every platform. View from the living room. Dining room. The kitchen. And the espresso bar. And this is a summer shot. But I guess I've designed the house for the winter. Well, in Canada, winter is more important, so you better design for winter. And the reason I selected these two projects was one of them is the smallest one, obviously, the other one is the longest one. Yet, Shaft House was designed for a developer, Opposite House was done for an end user. One of them infill project in the city, the other one freestanding structure in the nature. One of them vertical, one of them horizontal. One of them with a very low construction cost, 185 Canadian dollars per square foot. The other one 500 plus. One recycled material, the other one handmade brick imported from Denmark. So you can think of more difference between the two. Yet it's important because getting back to what Josh mentioned in the beginning and the Daniele's practice, design is one, design belongs to everyone and design has to be everywhere. So with no discrimination, I believe any project comes to a designer office, you should make something worthy out of it. And for us, the proof of that was both projects were published on the cover of Anthology's book both the shaft house and opposite house. So that was like um, an affirmation that you don't need a luxury, expensive, unlimited budget project to do something well designed. Regardless of that, design could be something worthy. Speaking of books, Josh already mentioned about two books, but I thought I would share it with you. The first monograph is Hopscotch, and the second one is The Empty Room. If you like to browse pictures and drawings and plans, this could be a better book, but this is all text, no image, no plan, 
no photograph. So if you like to read, this is a better pick. It's more like poetry and philosophy versus design. So I would say it's applicable to things beyond design itself. Speaking of publication, I have been doing this uh, in-house publication since 2009 called RZLDD Post. And this summer, finally, after 10 years, we managed to make it available on a shop at Shopify. So if you are interested, you can browse all the available copies there. To follow up with the practice and what's happening, you can also check the Instagram, Twitter, and our YouTube channel. I thought maybe it, it's fun to share with you a couple of images as behind the scenes. Often for presentation, we collect polished image, nice photographs done by professional photographers. But this is how I work on a day-to-day -day basis. And my best friend at the office is pencil. So I sketch a lot and I only touch computer for presentation materials. Every project has a big sketchbook. So only we start the construction document and actual drawing, then everything is resolved and figure out on paper. These are sketches for the shaft house. We also do lots of models and I think Hand drawings and physical models are so important because not only they represent this actual direct relationship from mind, hand to paper, but also they somehow carry within them the responsibility for a design. Then you have the luxury of control Z when you draw a line, whether it's 10 centimeters or 10 kilometers with computer, you draw it by defining a beginning and a destination point. So you lose the whole notion of escape. And with that, you won't quite feel responsible for, for the line you are drawing. But when you work with your hands, sketching things and building things, I think it's, it's more faithful to the challenge of the project you are working on. And that makes design a ritual, not a job, a vocation, not something to earn money. I started with a quote. I would like to finish with a quote, this one by Cloud Levi Strauss. Ritual is a machine for destruction of time. Let's destruct the time together. Thank you very much. Am I good time-wise? You're excellent time-wise. Um, I think your, your rigor translates into uh, your presentation skills. Thank you so much for this wonderful, thoughtful, and inventive presentation uh, of your work and your life and your commitment to, to design. Um, Reza, I, I want to um, read some of the questions that are coming from uh, tonight's audience. Uh, in the hopes that we can spend some time uh, to hear your thoughts on them. Uh, I'll start with the uh, one that just came in, which says, I read that while you were interning in Toronto, you would regularly quit your job after a year and go on solo expeditions. You mentioned this also in your talk, Reza. Um, what is your advice to young designers who would love to do the same, but are afraid that given the competitive nature of the job market, they will be falling behind or become less attractive candidates for future opportunities. Well, I guess it, it depends. It depends when are you when are you working, and when you would like to work. True, it may makes you a less uh, favorable candidate for a specific certain office. Yet it may makes you a better candidate for another set of office. I guess all the choices we make in life to shape our career belongs to one family of virtues and values that will define our career path. So of course, uh, if you are looking to work in competitive 
large firms, you need to develop a certain set of skill set. But if you want to apprentice in a smaller studio with an apprenticeship environment, you need another set of skill set and qualities. Mm -hmm. So don't worry. It works. It worked for me. It could work for anyone. <laughs> so I'm not sure if it's a, <laughs> it's a good answer. No, I think it's an excellent answer. Um, let me ask you this uh, from another uh, participant in tonight's lecture. What does a day in the life at Atelier RZLBD look like? Well, in terms of the timing, I would say for me, it's a continuous, um, I, I am a habitual of my work. So there is no definition between my life and my work. It's not like I start the day with some specific task and I close it at a certain time. So as I mentioned in the end, I think a designer life, an artist life, an architect life has to be a ritual. And ritual is something continuous with no interruption. So quite honest, I don't feel a beginning and ending on a day-to-day -day basis. For our clients, we open at 10 and we close at five just to, to handle the volume of emails and correspondences with them. But I am always there 7.30 a.m. or 8 a.m. and I often spend time <laughs> till late night. And I used to leave work in the beginning and I'm still looking for that opportunity again because I think I feel more comfortable with that. <laughs> <laughs> but um, as you, you may notice in the presentation, um, it's quite diverse from playing with used Nespresso pods to sketching, building models, doing site visits, having internal meetings, meetings with clients. So it's a quite chaotic set of activities and tasks that happen on a, on a daily basis. Mm. As a follow-up to that question, uh, what does the structure of your office look like? How many employees, uh, where, where are you located? That sort of uh, question. Well, the, at the moment, the office is uh, by location. You mean the address? No, no, not the address, but uh, <laughs> are, you, are you in the city? Are you in a rural? We are, we are in the city. We are in the city, but we are not in the architectural ghetto of the city. Um, this is another critique to what's happening in the city and most of the mainstream architectural firms. So we decided to be elsewhere, but we are in the city. Um, the office is basically one big empty room with no boardroom, no individual office. So we work together. At the moment, I only have one assistant. We are a very small office, and when I say boutique, it's not just a sexy word to, to, to brand the studio. We do three to four projects every year, and I want to be in control, and I want to do things uh, by myself, from sketching to working drawings. So it's not like a big firm with cubicles distributing tasks to, to many interns. So very small in a scale but trying to be uh, responsible with what we do, which uh, reminds me of another quote by Massimo Vanielli once he mentioned uh, uh, the ambition is not in the size of the job or the practice. The ambition is in the size of the thing you put into the, pro into the project. <laughs> so in that sense, we are quite ambitious. But on paper, you could say we are a boutique studio. Fantastic, great answers, thank you. Um, another question that's come in is, which project of yours are you the most proud of? That's never a good question, I guess. Don't never, don't ask that from any designer. I mean, it's like uh, asking a parent which kids they love the most. So uh, it's, it's hard. It's hard to answer, but what I can elaborate on that is 
Uh, I don't edit the portfolio. So it's not like we do some project and we hide them under the table and we do some good projects and we put it on the website and publish them. We do a project if it is a portfolio project. Even if it's not a portfolio project, we make it a portfolio project. We drag the client, we struggle with the condition to make something good out of it. Great. Um, there are actually a lot of questions now, but I'm trying to pick some uh, ones that will give you a bit of a challenge. Um, this one, um, I'm curious to know how you answer it or if this condition exists for you. But the question is, how do you get past artists block when iterating so many times around the same idea? So I guess the question is, you know, does does this happen to you? Do you do you reach a creative impasse? And if so, how, how do you deal with this? I guess uh, that's the whole point. When you do work in series, I refer back to the Italo Calvino quote. Yeah. The pressure of creation goes away. You don't feel obliged that you have to create something unique and specific. You just iterate and reiterate and reiterate. And that itself just dissolves that notion of artist block. And then when you have a body of work, you will see that you have many solutions and some could be appropriate for a problem you were trying to, to solve. So I think this working in series helps a lot to avoid that whole challenge. Hmm. That's a great answer. And, and because so many of these questions are coming in from inquisitive students, I think this is uh, important and useful uh, information for them. Uh, here's an interesting one. Many of your designs feature rectilinear shapes. Is that a personal preference? How do you feel about the use of curves and organic shapes in architecture? Uh, not yet. Not yet. Uh, most of the projects I shared with you, architectural project, of course, uh, they are in city. Mm. A city like Toronto, which is based on a grid and it's quite restricted by zoning and by the regulation. So I guess rectilinear form is a given. But we have done some other projects and proposals like uh, elementary school in Africa or a place of worship in Rwanda. And in those projects where we have a freer context, we have explored freer forms, but that could be another presentation with focus on architectural project. Maybe I can cover a more diverse range of projects. But speaking of rectangles and curves, again, I get back to Borges, not curved for the sake of excitement or drawing attention or generating a Instagrammable form. If you can convince yourself and you can, if the project asks for a curve, yes, why not? If not, uh, not just as a formal gesture, I wouldn't, I wouldn't do that. Excellent. Uh, I think we have time for one more, and, and perhaps this is a, a good one to uh, to finish on. Uh, this uh, person asks, living the artist-designer ritual of continuous practice, do you ever feel burnt out? Uh, well, you will be surprised that the more you push your capacity, you will find, how do you say it in English, uncharted territories within you. Sure. So that limit comes with your imagination. I guess the more you push it, you, you will figure out the more resources you have. So don't worry about that. Just keep, keep trying, <laughs> keep trying. <laughs> Excellent. Well, this is great advice for uh, our, our young listeners tonight. 
Um, Reza, I want to thank you so much for this uh, incredibly spirited and insightful um, presentation this evening. I think you've, you've left us all with a great deal to think about and to be inspired by. Uh, you, you've drawn wonderful parallels uh, to the Vignelli's uh, work and ethos. And uh, so for that, we thank you greatly. Um, and we look forward to uh, hosting you uh, in person in the future when it's safe to do so. Um, Thank you very much. The pleasure was mine. If I may, since for the first time I visited the Vignelli Center with Roger and he was so kind and generous giving me a tour at all floor levels, I'm not sure if he is among the audience or not. If yes, my warmest regard, Roger. If not, please pass the word to him. <laughs> We'll take care of it either way for you. Thank you. <laughs> uh, so I want to thank everyone for joining us tonight as well. And uh, please follow us on our social channels and our website and mark your calendars for next month's Design Conversations lecture. Take care, everyone. Thank you again, Reza. And uh, stay healthy and stay well. Buona notte. Buona notte. <laughs>